Well, Edwards is associated with many things. Uh, Ryan Townsend from our church gave me a copy of this weekend's Wall Street Journal. Did any of you see this? Raise your hand if you saw this. A few of you? Several of you. Yeah, there he was, Jonathan Edwards, on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. And what's the title of the article? Hell yes. Hell yes. Yeah, that's the title of the article. Uh, the conclusion of the editorial is from the vantage of modernity, the blind spots of Jonathan Edwards are all too obvious, from his ownership of slaves to a self-righteousness that even his own congregation could not stomach. We'll come back to that. <laughs> but if the profoundly different outcomes achieved by America's liberal order and the other projects born of the Enlightenment are any clue, maybe he was right to suggest that those who discount hell in the afterlife are less apt to guard against creating one here on Earth. It's actually a positive statement about Edwards. Well, I know hell is what a lot of people associate Edwards with, but I'm not going to talk about Edwards on hell this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that people far less often talk about, about Jonathan Edwards, but that I think for t us today is terribly important. We're going to consider Jonathan Edwards and the church. So what I want to do in a sense, I want to take Ian's talk from this morning. Wasn't that a great just survey? of Edward's life quickly. I want, to, I want to take that one section of Ian's talk where for about five minutes he talked about what happened in Northampton and I want to sort of put a magnifying glass on that. I, I want to inform you more about that to, to see what went on there exactly and what some of the causes of that were and then I want to spend the last part of the time drawing out some lessons that we can learn from his termination at Northampton. And then if we had time, because we got till 4.15, maybe a little bit of Q&A. But we'll see if we have time for that. All right. So let's get going now. Well, we've had good talks this morning on, as I say, on Jonathan Edwards' life uh, and on his teaching of heaven. That was a great meditation by Sam. This afternoon, we turn to the topic, how Jonathan Edwards got fired and why it's important for us today. Now, my guess is before some of you read the title to the seminar or before you heard the talk this morning, you may not have even known that Jonathan Edwards had been fired. Since humility is such a high Christian virtue, who will put up your hand in honesty and say that you did not know before you read the title of this seminar or heard the talk this morning that Edwards had been fired? Put up your hand. A lot of hands. See? Yeah, it's just it's not a famous fact about Edwards. If you go read a biography, you're going to notice it. But other than that, people think of him as... Well, he's a great preacher, he's associated with the Great Awakening, but many people are shocked to find out that Jonathan Edwards was actually fired. He was fired by a vote of his congregational church. It was a church structured with congregational polity, which we can talk about more later if you want in the Q&A. In July 1750, the members of his own congregation voted to sever the pastoral relationship between them. As best we can tell from Jonathan Edwards' own count of this, only 10% of the church members voted to keep Edwards as their pastor. So 90%, it seems, did not. As Edwards put it to a friend a couple of weeks later, the generality of the church members voted to send him away. But before he could be voted out, he had to first be voted in. So let's remind ourselves of that first. In April of 1725, the church in Northampton, Massachusetts, voted to find a colleague pastor for the ailing Solomon Stoddard, the so-called Pope of the Connecticut Valley, and Jonathan Edwards' mother's father. In August of 1726, Edwards was first invited to preach there. In November of that year, 1726, Edwards was invited to settle in Northampton. He accepted the call to become the assistant pastor, and it was the assumed potential presumed successor of his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, at the church in Northampton, which was arguably the most important church center outside of Boston. Stoddard was certainly one of the most celebrated ministers in New England, and it's at this point that Edwards' biography and that of his family get so closely intertwined with his understanding of the church and the purpose of our seminar this afternoon. So a little history, and this is a seminar if you've got to indulge me, okay? Back in 1662, the congregational churches in New England had struck a compromise of sorts in order to give many of the rights of church membership including most especially the right of having their own children baptized, to those who made no profession of conversion. Okay, you need to understand this if the rest of the story is going to make sense. In 1662, the Congregational Church in New England had taken the unusual step of deciding that they would extend rights of church membership 
to those who made no professional conversion. And the right that was most contended for was the right to baptize their children. This would allow them to enjoy all the privileges of church membership, really, except for the Lord's table. That was withheld from them because they didn't profess to be Christians. And this agreement done in 1662 was known as the halfway covenant. That's right, because they were kind of halfway in the church. Of the two sacraments, they got one. You know, it was, it was the halfway covenant. Well, it was it was a bitterly debated thing. Increase Mather, a great Puritan name, Increase Mather, one of the leading Puritan preachers in New England, strongly opposed it. He bitterly opposed it. But finally, that halfway covenant was generally accepted by the churches. OK, so that's being generally accepted a few decades before Edwards is born. So you just need to understand the context. Solomon Stoddard, Edwards' grandfather, was a minister who came to prominence in this time. The church in Northampton had been founded by Increase Mather, this bitter opponent to it, the halfway covenant, by his brother, Eliezer Mather. See, these families are all connected in New England because there are not that many people there. You know, it's, just, it's like modern day Western Kentucky, where I'm from. I mean, there, there aren't a lot of us, so we're all related. This church, this church in Northampton was one of the congregations which had rejected the halfway covenant. So it was, you would call it, I guess, kind of a conservative church with a higher standard of membership. Well, Eliezer Mather, who founded the church, died in 1669. He was immediately succeeded by Solomon Stoddard, who was himself a champion of the new halfway covenant. Stoddard not only took Mather's church, Stoddard took Mather's wife. He married Mr. Mather's widow. So Stoddard himself then became the leader of that community in Northampton. And the church quickly followed this new way advocated by Stoddard. Soon they had covenant members who gave evidence of, of conversion and were admitted to the Lord's table and non-covenant members, they were called, who did not give evidence of conversion and were not admitted to the Lord's table. OK, so are we with me so far? We understand the halfway covenant and what's going on there. OK, that's that's the background that you need to know. That's in the background. OK, within a few years, something the plan's proponents had not foreseen occurred. Anybody want to guess what that is? I need one person who has a loud voice. Raise your hand. Yes, up top. Well, kind of, but, but, but there's something that makes that, them desiring that even more important. Oh, well, that's, that's certainly true. They, want, they, they did want the vote. They outnumbered the covenant people, and they hadn't thought of that <laughs> when they propounded this plan. But the, 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 the halfway covenant or the non-covenant members quickly came to outnumber the covenant members. Well... After several years of wrestling with this, in 1700, Stoddard suggested a fundamental change. And so that Stoddard's not just some figure that, you know, we, we revile against in favor of Edwards. We need to understand what Stoddard was dealing with and what led him to these positions. Stoddard suggested a fundamental change in the way the Lord's Supper was given. He suggested that it would be, it should be expanded to include all of those members, regenerate, and unregenerate who wanted to partake, accepting only those who were scandalous livers. That was his phrase. That is, whose very coming to the table and taking the Lord's Supper would, would defame the gospel in the community. So except for those people, then everybody should be welcomed. Mr. Stoddard's way, as it was known, had been practiced for many years quietly in Northampton under his pastorate, then, about 1700, he began to make it known and to advocate it. Well, once again, Increase Mather, his wife's former brother-in-law, the brother-in-law of his wife's first husband, Increase Mather led the charge against this innovation. Just as he had opposed the halfway covenant 40 years before, he now opposed this change of Stoddard's. 
Stoddard published treatises in favor of his position, claiming that it might help in converting the unregenerate. And soon Stoddard's way became the practice in many, perhaps most, of the congregational churches in New England. One can immediately grasp why it would be popular. Now back to Edwards. Okay, in February of 1727, Edwards was ordained a co-pastor of the church at Northampton, working alongside his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard. Two years later, on February 11, 1729, Solomon Stoddard died. And so Jonathan Edwards became the sole pastor of the most important congregation in western Massachusetts with over 600 members. Now, you've got to understand, an assembly this large is no big deal in downtown Minneapolis. In the western part of mid-18th century Massachusetts, it's a striking thing just to see this many people together. They assembled regularly a group this large, probably only in one place in western Massachusetts. And that was the church at Northampton. That's a bit of the significance, even socially, that Edwards took on in succeeding Stoddard. Stoddard's funeral was the first very public occasion then for the beginning of Edwards' solo pastorate. His first couple of years were pretty quiet. He goes and he delivers a celebrated lecture in Boston on July 8, 1731, a great sermon entitled God Glorified in Man's Dependence. If you want a good place to start with Edwards, that is another great place to start with Edwards. God Glorified in Man's Dependence. This, this lecture in Boston was a regular Thursday lecture, but it got very large when Harvard commencement was going on. So to be asked to do it that week was a big honor, and they asked Edwards to do it that week, and it was the best attended lecture of the year, and it was going to be particularly interesting because it was Jonathan Edwards giving the lecture. And, of course, if you're one of the Boston clergy, it's unusual that somebody from outside of Boston is invited to give this very prestigious lecture. Not only that, but they were always given by Harvard graduates. Now, all of a sudden, you've got somebody from Yale, which is like New Haven Community College. You know, I mean, it's just gotten started. It's, it's a junior institution to Harvard. There weren't many colleges around. And so to have somebody like that come and give a lecture was seen as a little strange because Yale even had some questionable things going on. Its reputation wasn't great. Also, you've got to remember, Edwards was very young when he was starting out like this. He was 28 at the time when he was asked to give it. He was also the grandson of the famous Solomon Stoddard, who had given this lecture before, as Perry Miller, a biographer of Edwards, described it, the figure who stood before the congregation on this Thursday morning was the newly crowned successor of a rival principality. And the Boston clergy turned out to greet him as some privy council might greet the fledgling heir of a competing power. Well, anyway, in this difficult situation, Edwards gave this lecture on God glorified in man's dependence, and it was a success. It was printed within a month. It was his first sermon to be printed. Its printed title is God glorified in the work of redemption by the greatness of man's dependence upon him in the whole of it. It's a great title. You know, when you get titles like that, you got a sermon just in the title. Well, Edwards continued on in his ministry. He saw revivals in his work in Northampton during the next few years, most notably. Uh, from December of 1734 through the spring of 1735. So when Ian this morning mentioned that first awakening in 1734, 1735, you may have been thinking, ah, 24 months of awakening. No, about four or five months. Very short thing. December 1734, the spring of 1735, the church membership increased by several score during that time, so that by the next year, 1736, they had to build a new meeting house to accommodate the increase. Jonathan Edwards continued as the pastor of this congregation for more than a decade, having an international reputation until, in July of 1750, the members of the church voted by, as I said, a margin of 10 to 1, as best we can tell, to dismiss him. Ten days later, Edwards preached his final sermon to them as their pastor. Well, the situations which led to his dismissal are a long story, which have to do with everything from botched pastoral moves to disputes over salary, uh, envy in the town, perceived coolness and aloofness on the part of Mr. Edwards, long-standing tensions in his extended family, we could go on. I mean, to answer why questions is almost always finally impossible from any human perspective, at least to do so fully. And many of the particulars in this would only be of interest to historians, and I'm not going to presume that here in this seminar this afternoon. I think at the very heart of the controversy which led to Edwards being fired was church discipline. And especially the question of who was to be admitted to the Lord's table. Because Jonathan Edwards had come to disagree with his venerable grandfather. And the shock to the unity of the church 
was enough to send Edwards tumbling out of his pulpit. Twenty-three years of spectacularly faithful ministry, notwithstanding. Well, Edwards had seven more years to live. As we heard this morning, they were mainly spent in Stockbridge, a mission settlement further west in Massachusetts. The last few months were spent in Princeton. Edwards arrived in Princeton February 16, 1758, was formally installed as the president of the college that same day and one week later, February 23rd, he was inoculated for smallpox, and after one month lacking a day on March 22nd, he died from it. Jonathan Edwards lived to be only 20, 54, um, and as Ian said this morning, his daughter Esther and, uh, died very soon thereafter, and then a few months later, his wife Sarah. Just a little sidebar that has nothing to do with this seminar that may interest you. Esther's, Esther's husband had died, who was named Aaron Burr. They had a son named Aaron Burr, who became the vice president of the United States and killed the man who's on your $20 bill in your wallet, Alexander Hamilton. That's one of the things that Jonathan Edwards' family did. Anyway, <laughs> boy, what an influential family his has been. In Edwards' brief life, he had had the privilege of having a ministry of tremendous importance for a number of reasons, and not least, not least among those reasons, was Edwards' strong reassertion of the visible nature of the church. So if you're looking for a theme in this seminar that you signed up for with its provocative title, that's it. It's Edwards' strong reassertion of the visible nature of the church, particularly reflected in his understanding of the Lord's Supper as an ordinance for believers. All right. So now let's focus in more particularly on that. The controversy surrounding Edwards' views on communion had gone on for a couple of years, uh, from 1748 until its resolution by his ejection in 1750. As I say, the setting for this controversy was a church already frayed by some tensions between the pastor and some of the leading families. And here... You just have to bring out for people to know what's been called the bad book case back in 1744, four years earlier, which George Marsden in his new biography of Edwards has argued it should be called the young folks Bible case. In any way, Edwards had alienated probably unnecessarily a number of families by reading publicly after a morning service the names of the young people that he wanted to see concerning a certain scandal. But in reading these names in the service, he had left the impression that all of these young people had behaved scandalously. When all Edwards was really doing was asking that certain of the young people come to see him so that he could get more information from them. Well, that was a monumentally bad thing to do. But it was only so bad because there was already tension there. Pastors among us will understand the importance of such small miscalculations and how they can have incalculable effects. How is it Marsden put it? He describes Edwards as one uh, never given to excessive tact. That's Marsden's page 344. And as having a personality that was bristle and unsociable. It's Marsden, page 349. I don't know if that's accurate. I can ask Jim Packard tonight uh, in the, in the um, interview time if, if Jonathan Edwards was really that way. <laughs> Jim's not in there to defend himself. Anyway, <laughs> Edwards continued to pastor the church and to write prolifically, producing most notably a treatise concerning religious affections in 1746 and 1747, and in 1747, rather, a humble attempt to promote explicit agreement, and in 1749, an account of the life of the Reverend David Brainerd that we heard about this morning. But it was in 1748 that this dissension really seemed to take hold in Edwards' church, dealing with the difficulties of pastoral ministry, became even more difficult when that year his influential and supportive uncle, Colonel John Stoddard, Solomon Stoddard's eldest son, died. Various of the clergy who had been disaffected with Edwards for one reason or another began to feel more free to voice their dissatisfaction. So the divisions inside his congregation were being encouraged by those from the outside. The Hawleys and the Williamses had had their differences with Edwards. Some matters of church discipline, perhaps poorly handled, had caused stresses and strains. Okay, so it's against the backdrop of all of these tensions. And we need to see that to be fair to everybody involved. It was against the backdrop of these existing tensions that the controversy over communion broke out in earnest. Here's how it happened. In December of 1748, all right, now in hindsight, we know now it's only about 16 months later they'll fire him over it. So it didn't take that long. 
In December of 1748, again, pastors imagine this. Edwards told someone that they must profess Christianity before they could take communion. That's that's the little thing that lighted the fire. It's a pastoral conversation. This person wants to take communion. Edwards tells them in private that they need to profess conversion first. The applicant talked to others about this. The applicant refused to profess being a Christian. He was happy to profess godliness. He wasn't a scandalous liver. But he was not happy to profess being a Christian. He withdrew his application for membership in the church. Well, tongues wagged. Eyebrows were raised. In February of 1749, Edwards proposed that he preach about this change in the terms of admission to communion. He proposed preaching a series of sermons to teach the congregation. The leaders of the church said no. They told Edwards he could make his case in print. And he did. He he then went to writing on it. In the meantime, in April, in God's providence, Mary Hulbert presented herself for communion and membership. But Edwards and the church committee couldn't agree on whether she should make a profession of faith in order to do this or whether such action would prejudice the church. So in order to break the impasse, Edwards bought time by offering to resign. If the church would wait until after his defense of his change of view were written and published so that they would have a chance to carefully consider his views. The committee of church leaders, by a vote of 15 to 3, said no. It was not to be allowed. So they could not agree on how Mary Hulbert should be allowed to join the church. Well, in the midst of all this, it also began to be clear that Edwards also had come to disagree even with the halfway covenant itself. The practice of New England churches of baptizing the infants of baptized yet non-communing church members. Well, this only further alienated many of Edwards church members who felt that their own rights to church privileges were being threatened because they've got an overly zealous and narrow young pastor. In a letter to John Erskine in Scotland, written on May 20th, 1749, Edwards mentioned the controversy, quoting Edwards here now in this letter. A very great difficulty has arisen between my people relating to qualifications for communion at the Lord's table. My honored grandfather Stoddard, my predecessor in the ministry over this church, strenuously maintained the Lord's Supper to be a converting ordinance and urged all to come who were not of scandalous life, though they themselves knew themselves to be unconverted. I formerly conformed to his practice, but I have had difficulties with respect to it, which have been long increasing till I dared no longer proceed in the former way, which has occasioned great uneasiness among my people and has filled all the country with noise. Well, in August of 1749, Edward's new book had arrived in Northampton. An humble inquiry into the rules of the word of God concerning the qualifications requisite to a complete standing and full communion in the visible Christian church. And um, you can go read that title again or the whole work uh, in the two volumes of Edward's works. It's there. That fall, the fall of 1749, so remember where we are in time now, fall of 1749, a secular meeting of the citizens urged the church to separate Edwards, either from his new principles or from the church. In December, a council of local ministers was convened to look into the case. In February of 1750, Edwards decided to lecture on his opinions on Thursday afternoons at 2 p.m. Now, this was cheeky. You remember he had earlier asked if he could just pursue this by preaching. And they said no. Well, so Edwards has waited a while, and now he's just gone on and done it anyway. You know, he's decided that he will pursue this. The sermons, it's said by the people at the time, were very well attended. The church was full of visitors from other towns, but not his own church members. They were fed up, and they didn't want to hear. They were no avail. There was a series of divisive church meetings throughout the spring, issuing in this formal meeting of the Council of Ministers from June 19th to the 22nd. So they sat for four days in 1750. The council asked to know the congregation's mind on the matter. 
and in especially called members' meetings, only 10%, and I think that's what we really know. You hear various things said, but I think as Edwards recounts it, only 10% of the church's members voted for Edwards to remain as their pastor. The council then decided just by one vote that the relations between Edwards and the congregation in Northampton should be dissolved. Marsden sums the matter up this way, quote, Without his clumsily managed reversal of direction on the terms of admission to the sacraments, Edwards would have remained pastor in Northampton. True, there were pent-up resentments that came pouring out when the occasion arose. Nonetheless, the question of admission to the sacraments was in itself a momentous issue with potential to disrupt even a harmonious relationship between a pastor and a town. You know, perhaps if Edwards had introduced this more slowly, if he had taught on it in the normal course of an expositional ministry, if he'd raised questions in people's minds as he had discipled them, we can only speculate. On July 1st, 1750, Edwards preached one of the most remarkable sermons that he or any pastor, to my knowledge, has ever preached. He preached his farewell sermon, as we heard today from 2 Corinthians 1.14. As also you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. This sermon is remarkable for its gravity and its tenderness, its love and its certainty, and the evident deep trust in God that Edwards had to preach it. Strangely enough, Edwards, in what must have been a rather awkward situation, continued to live in the parsonage and to preach for them, Sunday by Sunday, at their request, until October of 1751, 15 months later. Preachers were not easy to come by. And they had one right there who at least he could hoe the field. You know, he at least knew how to do it. So they just kept week by week asking him, you know, I don't know what, somebody got to Tuesday, Wednesday, they couldn't find anybody. Mr. Edwards, would you mind preaching for us again? <laughs> it's a terribly difficult situation for Edwards to be in. Can you imagine his wife, his children? But there he is for over a year, continuing to preach to them. The next year, 1752, from his home in Stockbridge, Edwards sent to the press the only other major work he published on this question. So if you want to read Edwards on it, here it is. Misrepresentations corrected and truth vindicated in a reply to the Reverend Mr. Solomon Williams' book. And if you get Edwards' collected works, that's in volume one. So you can find it and, and go read it there. Well, this was his answer to Solomon Williams, Edwards' cousin, who had written defending Solomon Stoddard's practice and the decision of the Northampton Church. Of course, this controversy had been settled already by the dismissal of Edwards, so it wasn't continuing to disturb Northampton. Nevertheless, Edwards just, you know, in his precise and perfectionist way, wanted to correct finally in writing any misunderstandings or misrepresentations that had been made. By the end of the century, Solomon Stoddard's converting ordinances idea, the idea that prevailed in the church at Northampton and over Edwards' objections, Stoddard's idea became virtually extinct. After his death, Edwards' ideas won out. In all of this, it is evident that Edwards' concern was a concern that had marked various parts of the Reformation and which was especially typical of the New England Puritan heritage he had received, the concern for the visibility of the church, the visibility of the church. By requiring a profession of faith by those who are considered full members of the church, including that includes being allowed to come to the Lord's table, Edwards was hearkening back to the need for a clear distinction between the church and the world. And it is to me as a pastor hugely impressive that he was willing to put all of his personal convenience all of his personal convenience as a 46-year-old man with a large and therefore expensive to maintain family on the line for what he understood to be faithfulness to Scripture on this particular matter. Now, as earlier separatists had maintained before him, Edwards understood that the visible church will always be mixed. He was not saying he could perfectly discern regeneration and that the invisible church was perfectly visible to him. He was not saying that. He understood the visible church will always be mixed. And yet, its purity was an asset to be cherished and improved. The fact that he was certain that it would be mixed was in no way an excuse for indifference or complacence about the moral purity of the church. In Edward's sermons, particularly in his humble inquiry, Edwards advocated the simple idea that, quote, none ought to be admitted as members of the visible church of Christ, but visible and professing saints, end of quote. 
Edward summoned as examples of this the New Testament churches, both in Acts and the Epistles, supporting his case. So you can read Edwards biblically arguing for this in those, in those collected works of Edwards in Volume 1, about page 451, 452, 453, for several pages. He's just going to Scripture on this very matter to support his case. Based on such texts as 1 Corinthians 11, 28, let a man examine himself and so let him eat. Edwards argued that it is necessary, quoting Edwards now, it is necessary that those who partake of the Lord's Supper should judge themselves truly and cordially, that means from the heart, to accept of Christ as their only Savior and chief good. For of this, the actions which communicates perform at the Lord's table are a solemn profession. I think the argument is straightforward enough. Okay, what are we to learn from Edward Stand? Why should this be so important, not just that you would be willing to give an hour to come to a seminar on it, but that Edwards would be willing to be maligned and even fired over it? If he's this man who has this great judgment that we've been lauding as a great gift of God to the church, why would he make this judgment call? Why over this issue? I think the main thing that I've been challenged about as I reflect on Edwards' resolve in this matter is the clarity with which he perceived that the church is to be visible. And in order to be visible, it must visibly be the church. We are to remember afresh that part of what we need to do is not simply try to make the church as accessible and comfortable as possible for the non-believer, but we must labor to make it as pure and as holy as it can be for all concerned. For believers and non-believers, for ourselves and others and the church and even for the glory of God himself. J.H. Thornwell, the great Southern Presbyterian theologian of the 19th century, noticed the churches in his day moving in a dangerous direction, a direction which he feared might compromise the very message of the church. In a letter that he wrote in July of 1846, so this is you know 70 years later, or well, 100 years later from when Edwards was fired, Thornwell warned that, our whole system of operations gives an undue influence to money. Where money is the great want, the great need, that is, numbers must be sought. And where an ambition for numbers prevails, doctrinal purity must be sacrificed. The root of the evil is in the secular spirit of all our ecclesiastical institutions. What we want is a spiritual body, a church whose power lies in the truth and the presence of the Holy Ghost. To unsecularize the church should be the unceasing aim of all who are anxious that the ways of Zion should flourish, end of quote. Well, like the compromised church at Northampton, so too among evangelicals of our own day, somewhere along the way, something has happened to our own ideas of church membership. And what touches membership touches the visibility of the church and the clarity and credibility of the gospel we preach to the world. Edwards seemed to understand this and to understand its importance. Now, we modern evangelicals may not have self-consciously entered into a halfway covenant. We may not be inviting non-Christians officially to communion as they were in Edwards' day. But can anyone deny that membership in a church and the symbolic core of membership in the church is coming to the Lord's table? Can anybody deny that membership in a church is less meaningful today than it was a century ago? And if that is true, what kind of progress does that evidence or portend in sanctification, in evangelization, in missions, in bringing glory to our great creator and sustainer? Now, is this a peculiarly American phenomenon, a leftover of the cultural dominance evangelical Christianity enjoyed here in the past? I, I know I read recently the average Baptist church in England has 73 members and 85 in attendance. 73 members, 85 in attendance. In the U.S., the average attendance on Sunday morning among Southern Baptist churches, those were the statistics I found easiest to hand, was actually somewhat smaller, about 70, but still comparable. What was way out of line was instead of having a slightly smaller membership, almost all of whom would be in attendance with some you know, visitors added in, the average Southern Baptist church had 233 members with only 70 in attendance. Now, that seems to happen not just to some, then, that they don't keep coming, but to most. And it's not just among Baptists. I could go through the statistics of denomination after denomination. 
local congregation after local congregation had observed a laxness about church membership, which is undermining to the very gospel itself in a way that's very similar to the situation Edwards was facing. In part three of Edwards' humble inquiry, Edwards asks why, asks why parents would be so concerned about the signs and symbols for their children, by which they mean that their children could be baptized and their children could come to the Lord's Supper. And so evidently less concerned that they have the reality symbolized by them. Edwards wrote, what is the name good for without the thing? Can parents bear to have their children go about the world in the most odious and dangerous state of soul? In reality, the children of the devil and condemned to eternal burnings when at the same time they can't bear to have them disgraced by going without the honor of being baptized. A high honor and privilege this is. Yet how can parents be contented with the sign exclusive of the thing signified? Why should they covet the external honor for their children while they are so careless about the spiritual blessing? Edwards goes on like this for pages. That's the situation he found as he looked out in his church. Well, perhaps for us today, it's not strictly that membership has become meaningless and that it doesn't matter, but that it has the wrong meaning and that it certain matters wrongly. Today, at least in the circles I travel in, and I know it pertains to at least a few other denominations as well, a kind of high affection, low commitment idea of membership is common. That is, today we join a church as a testimony that we like it. We leave our membership there. We move someplace else. Because we have familial ties there. It doesn't say anything about whether we intend to attend the church, pray for the church, give to the church, work to forward the gospel through that church. What we need is an exact reversal to take place. Ideas of membership should not be so associated with simply with mere affection. I mean, I can love people who are not members of my church, and I sometimes, frankly, find that easier. <laughs> what we need is an idea of church membership linked more to commitment, to what we'll actually do. Yes, make allowances for those who have recently moved, those who physically can't make it, those who are temporarily away for education or business or military service. But normalcy among evangelical Christians in the United States and elsewhere should be that a member of a church is in regular attendance and is growing in love to God and man and holiness of life. Church discipline, too, should be reinvigorated to recover this winsome and hope giving distinction that we Christians are to have from the world. So why is discipline important? Why is Edward's recovery of the idea of regenerate church membership important? Because the gospel matters. And because God has elected to move in human history in a corporate way. Did God send his son uniquely? Yes, he did. Did he raise up prophets and apostles? Yes, he did. Does he gift his church with pastors and teachers and servants and workers of ministry? Yes. Does he save us as individuals? Yes. But that's not the whole story. By the stand that Edwards took, even to the point of sacrificing his own reputation, position and welfare, Edwards was only reflecting God's concern with the church. The church is God's idea. It's not some union of pastors who need jobs. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who founded the church in Matthew 16. The church is there to manifest and display the glory of God. How will the satanic splendor against or the satanic, the satanic slander against God's glory be refuted by your own individual delighting in God? No, I don't think so. At least that's not God's plan. Listen to all the individualistic evangel evangelical stuff you want. And it's all true. But there's more in the Bible. The Bible also talks about whole communities of people in which you see a whole bunch of relationships all in their own individual ways, bringing glory to God as people are related to in love and forgiveness and mercy and justice and honesty. And there's something in that social aspect which you do not see in the most momentously virtuous individual Christian. That is how God has decided to have his glory displayed in the world. And we ignore that to our own peril and to the peril of the very ones we want to evangelize and reach. So, friends, ironically, when you begin to think of the church as just a center for evangelism, you miss out one of the most important things in evangelism. That is that the church has a purpose in and of itself to be enjoying God, to be delighting in God, to be growing together in love. And that in and of itself is one of the crucial sort of sounding boards reflecting the truth of the gospel to the watching word world. That's from John 13, really, verses 34 and 35. 
Now, why should we act like Edwards to exclude certain people from the Lord's table in our own local churches? Why should we act to discipline or exclude people from communion? Well, I could give you a lot of good reasons. Let me just give you five. All right, I'll give you these five reasons, and then we'll have maybe a few minutes left for Q&A. Okay? Number one, you should do this for the good of the individual disciplined. The classic text is in 1 Corinthians 5, where you have a man who was lost in his sin, thinking God was fine with him having an affair with his father's wife. The people in the churches in Galatia thought it was fine that they were trusting in their own works rather than in Christ alone. Alexander and Hymenaeus thought they were fine in choosing those bars of gold on the Boston roads rather than God. But none of these were so. So out of their love for them, we want to see church discipline practiced. We don't want to allow them to come to the Lord's table to enjoy the benefits of the membership in our churches because we do want them to come to repentance and salvation. We don't want to publicly affirm them or to the watching world that they are the pictures of what it means to savingly repent and believe. We don't want our church to encourage hypocrites who are hardened, confirmed, lulled in their sins to sleep spiritually. We do not want to live the kind of life individually or as a church that's like that. We don't want to see people who are not partakers of Christ by faith being treated as if they were. My friends, that is not the judgment of charity. That is not charitable at all. And the writers of the New Testament understood that. We want this clarified for their own good. Now, you advocate this, and it will really show up whether people have only a subjective, psychologized understanding of the Christian faith, or if they really understand the real danger that we are in objectively because of our sins. Churches are not just feel-good, be-nice places where we go to work on our self-esteem and acceptance. You know, where it's in this, and you notice the popularity of games among some people today where nobody wins because they don't want anybody to lose. We need to just spend our time affirming each other. Friends, that's just not reality. We're going to stand before God and we're going to lose big time because we have been treasonous against him. I told John uh, Piper at lunch yesterday that for the PCRT coming up in a couple of years, the Philadelphia Conference on Reformation Theology, uh, I want to invite him to come speak on the undesirability of God to the natural man. Let's just be honest. The Bible teaches that God is not desirable at all. Not because of anything wrong with God, but because of something wrong with us. That in our natural state, we are at enmity with God. If we have people in our churches who give evidence of that consistently by their lives, you are not loving them if you don't talk to them about that and you continue to allow them to the Lord's table, affirming publicly that they are Christians. Oh, friends, they may well not know the reality of the great good things God's Spirit can do in their own heart and lives. You are helping to keep them blinded from the reality of that. And our churches are as they conspire together. I could say a lot more on that. Number two, for the good of other Christians, as they see the danger of sin, forbid some from coming to the Lord's table. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he said that if a leader sins, he should be rebuked publicly. And that does not mean that any time I sin, so that's going to be every day. So that doesn't mean that every Sunday I should have members of my church standing up saying, hey, Mark, you were wrong when you did this. Uh, what, what Paul means in 1 Timothy 5 is that when there is a serious sin, particularly it's not repented of, it needs to be brought up in public so that others take warning of the very serious nature of sin for their own soul's sake. I mean, even Solomon Stoddard understood that scandalous livers were not to come to the Lord's table because that would miscommunicate to Christians about the danger of sin and to non-Christians. Ask yourself, is there anything at your church that you could do that would inhibit you from taking the Lord's Supper? Is there any activity at all? So for the good of the other Christians, as they see the danger of sin, practice church discipline so that we see the seriousness of it. Number three, for the health of the church as a whole. Again, in that uh, chapter five of First Corinthians, when Paul is pleading with them, he said they should have boasted about having toleration for sin in the church. You know, it seems that church at Corinth was boasting that they could have this wide membership, that people like that were welcomed. You know, I can imagine the language they use, language we'd love. Oh, we're a fellowship of sinners. You know, oh, well, we all are different. 
Oh, we're very accepting and welcoming. Well, Paul asked rhetorically, don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Yeast represents the unclean, spreading nature of sin. So Paul said, get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival. That's the Passover supper. Not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. You understand, and the Jews there in the church at Corinth who have been converted would know the Passover meal had a lamb slaughtered and unleavened bread eaten. So what Paul is telling the Corinthian church here is, hey, look, the Passover lamb has already been slaughtered. That's Christ. And now all that we're waiting for is you to be that unleavened loaf. That, that loaf of bread that's not compromised with sin. And then you complete the sacrifice. You complete this festival. Christ had been slaughtered. The church was to be the unleavened bread. They were to have no leaven of unrepentant sin like that in them. So the whole church was to be an acceptable offering. And this would seem to mean that there were none to be partaking who were not Christians, who had not been forgiven by Christ. Now, of course, none of this means that discipline is the point of the local church. Please don't hear me saying that. Discipline is no more the point of the church than medicine is the point of life. You know, there may be times when you are necessarily consumed with it, but generally it's no more than that which allows you to get on with your main task. And it's certainly not the main task itself. The main task of the church, which Jonathan Edwards well knew, was glorifying God by preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet along with that, for the health of the church as a whole, Edwards also knew and advocated the position that church discipline should be practiced. And only those who give evidence of conversion should be allowed to come to the Lord's table. Only they should be members of our churches. Now, do not get all excited by this seminar on church discipline and go back in your church and try to start practice church discipline if you're not practicing it. Let me first encourage you to, to start practicing a real and vital fellowship together. Because all church discipline is, in that sense, is one part of that real and vital interpenetration and fellowship koinonia of lives. That when you begin to talk about more than, than sports and politics and business and family after church at your meetings, but you actually are talking about the state of your own soul, sins that you're struggling with and you pray with others, and that becomes a normal part of your church life, then church discipline follows along very naturally and normally. You'll still need to give leadership in it, but it's not just the odd thing. Sometimes... Pastors get so convicted about this from reading Matthew 18 or 1 Corinthians 5 that when their church empties out right after the service, just like that, you know, where there's no natural network of relationships because they're all in the same church, in a church like that, then they go try to start practicing church discipline. Friends, that won't work. That's a way to follow Edwards and just get fired, even if you've been there for 23 years. No, what we want to see in our churches are visible communities of believers where, yes, for, for the health of the church as a whole, discipline is practiced. But it's part of a larger commitment to seeing the church as the bride of Christ and to understanding what it should be like. Well, let, let me give you a fourth reason why we should practice church discipline. We should want to see discipline practiced in the church for the corporate witness of the church. And all I want to say about this is, friends, this is a very powerful tool in evangelism. I go from here to a trustee meeting of a seminary. And there I have other pastors talk to me all the time about, hey, have you seen this evangelistic program? Or, hey, what are you guys using? I've never once heard somebody say, you know what, we're using the church. We think the church is God's main evangelistic plan. But friends, I think the church is God's main evangelistic plan, and it's a wonderful plan where you see people whose lives are changed who don't necessarily have anything in common other than Christ. But they're fellowshipping together, they're loving each other, they're caring for each other. That's what God holds out to us in Scripture. People notice when our lives are different, especially when there's a whole community of people whose lives are different. Not whose lives are perfect, but whose lives are marked by genuinely trying to love God and love one another. All of this conformity of the church to the world just makes our evangelistic task more difficult. As Nigel Lee of British University once said, we become so like the unbelievers, they have no questions they want to ask us. Well, may we live so that people are made constructively curious. That's what we want to see in our churches. Let me give you, finally, the most compelling reason we should have church discipline. It's number five, for the glory of God, as we reflect his holiness. And here you can go to a lot of different passages of Scripture. Ephesians 5, Hebrews 12, 1 Peter 1 and 2, 1 John 3. You see, this is why we are alive. This is why you are drawing breath right now. We humans are made to bear the image of God, to carry his image and his character to his creation. 
So it is no surprise that throughout the Old Testament, as God fashioned a people, a whole people, to bear his image, he instructed them in holiness so that their character might better approximate his own. That's what the Lord says in Leviticus and in Proverbs. This was the basis for correcting and even excluding some people in the Old Testament as God fashioned a people for himself. And so, when you come to the New Testament, this is the basis we see for the New Testament church as well. In the passages I've mentioned, we find that Christians are supposed to be conspicuously holy. Not for our own reputation, but for God's reputation. In Matthew chapter 5, we see that we're to be the light of the world. When people see our good deeds, they are to glorify God. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 2, 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is why God called us. This is why he saved us. This is why he's set us apart and called us together. I mean, what else should we look like if we bear his name? Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. From the very beginning, Jesus had sent his disciples out to teach people to obey all that he taught. God will have a holy people to reflect his character. And then when you go and you read the picture of the church at the very end of the book of the Bible, at the, at the end of Revelation, you see it's this glorious bride. And what is the glorious bride doing? Reflecting the glory of the bridegroom. Reflecting the glory of Christ in Revelation 21 and 22. Exactly when we read those words then in 22, the words of Christ outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So taking 1 Corinthians 5 as a model, churches have long recognized church discipline as one of the boundaries that makes church membership mean something. The assumption is that a church member is someone who can appropriately take communion without bringing disgrace on the church, condemnation on themselves, or dishonor to God and his gospel. Edwards understood better than his grandfather, that it was not only moral uprightness, but the true spiritual life that was to be reflected in the church. It is by the collection of such spiritually alive people coming together that God is glorified as the church is made visible, and it is through the church being made visible that the gospel is displayed. Again, what was it Jesus said in Matthew 5? Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. It is this shining, this visibility of the light of God's word and of his hope for sinners that is the role of the church and that pastors should cultivate in churches, even if people resent it and misunderstand it, even if they gossip about us, are cruel to us, are cruel to our families, even if it costs us our jobs and our reputations, as it did Jonathan Edwards. But then, Edwards didn't live to please men, but to please God. I love the statement of David Hall about Edwards' conduct. During that time, the ministerial council was investigating those few days in June of 1750. When they delivered the news that his relation with the Northampton congregation should be dissolved, this witness of Edward's reaction at the time recorded, and I quote now, he's speaking of Jonathan Edwards when he hears the news from the council. That faithful witness received the shock unshaken. I never saw the least symptoms of displeasure in his countenance the whole week, but he appeared like a man of God, and I love this phrase, whose happiness was out of the reach of his enemies. Well, friends, this was Jonathan Edwards' vision of the visible church, visible to the glory of God. And it is a vision that we should today reaffirm. The church is to be constituted of believers, 
Not because we don't want many people in it. It's because we want more people in it. And we think if they see true believers in it, more will come. So it will be visible to the glory of God. And that glory comes not by our exalting in our own individualistic independence, but in our glorious dependence on God and creating distinct societies of love in a world of selfishness. God help us when our doctrine of the church stands to protect human pride and self-individualism. God help us to recover this biblical vision of the church, the vision that by God's grace our forebears like Edwards really had, the vision of the church visibly shining and distinct from the world, radiantly distinct, visibly reflecting the glory of God. Well, I want to do Q&A, but I have to pray after saying that before we can do any Q&A. All right, let's pray for God. Lord, you know all the ways that we do not understand you, all the ways we do not understand your will perfectly. Lord, you know all the ways we don't understand even your word that you have revealed. God, you know our own stupidities. You know the sins of each one of us here in this room. Lord, given all of that, we still pray that you would work to your glory, that you, by your spirit, would pour out your grace upon us in our lives, Lord, in our churches. That your spirit would so work to create witnesses for yourself and your glory in our churches that you would get much glory. Oh, God, take each of those things in our own hearts that are opposing the truth of your word at these points and lovingly and tenaciously subvert them. Lord, undermine them. Overwhelm us with your love and the glorious vision of a hope of holiness that we have in you. And God, we pray that you would spread this vision in our churches so that your gospel would not be obscured, but it would be held up like a light, like a city on a hill in the darkness. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, we've got about five minutes for any quick questions. Now, listen, let me tell you some things that I'm just going to not deal with. You can't ask a question if it's just a personal interest to you. You can see me down here afterwards. If you have a question that you think would be edifying for us all to think about together for less than about 60 seconds... So you don't go trotting out some difficult church discipline case, all right? That's, that's just not going to do it right now. All right? Um, yeah, right here in the middle. Got to speak loudly. And sh- Great question. How was congregational communion done in New England at the time, and how do we fence the table today? Congregationally at the time, I, I don't know. Do you know? They came forward and sat on the table. I know they did it in the church. It was small, but I think by the time they got large, they didn't do that anymore. I think they probably passed the elements. It'd be some combination. They would not come to a rail and kneel. They would run from that because of the associations with that. They would in the churches when they were earlier and they were smaller. They would like the Dutch reform. They would have a table. They would come and they would sit down often in twelves from the Last Supper. Um, as the churches got larger, then they tended to bring the elements out to the people. But exactly, I don't know. As far as how we fence the table today, for those of you who don't know it, that's the language of how do you make qualifications about who should come. I think the pastor at the beginning of the service needs to simply say very clearly, uh, you know, who should come and who should not come. And frankly, our churches will have some disagreements between us about that. So I leave that to your own to your own church. Yes, sir. Right there. It's a great question. What about Edwards teaching his own eldership or leadership? Uh, after 1729, there were no elders in the church other than Edwards. Um, for some reason, they let that office lapse. Uh, as far as him trying to teach other leaders, I simply don't know. And many times when I say I don't know, it's simply a statement of my own ignorance. Um, here, it's a little bit more than that. I think there probably just isn't much to be known about that, I fear. Anyway. Yes, right up there. Well, you want all the verses, uh, you know, as people being against each other away. You, you want to try to not do that. You want to try to lead patiently, teach from Scripture, show obvious love, a concern for bringing people into the kingdom so that nobody's going to be able to charge you with being more concerned you get people out than that you get people in. That would be a terrible witness. Um, I would just prefer to get one of those nine marks of healthy church booklets that we're giving away for free and see if that would be of help. All right. Expositional preaching is going to be the first thing that I'm going to suggest with sensitivity to these issues. Yes, right here.
That's a great question. What I consider Edwards firing um, a, uh, an evidence against congregationalism and for elder rule in a church? Uh, no. <laughs> well, only very briefly, only very briefly. Um, I'm not here mainly to talk about church structure. Uh, but you get a little book that I've written called The Display of God's Glory, in which I try to lay this out about elder leadership in a church, I think, should be there. But I think in the New Testament, there's also congregationalism. You know, Jesus did not say in Matthew 18 is the final step, tell it to the elders. He said, tell it to the church. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 is not yelling at the elders. He's yelling at the whole church for doing that. In Galatians chapter 1, when you get to doctrine, even not just discipline, but doctrine, Paul is writing to the whole church and a young church. When he says to this church, if, if I should come and preach to you a gospel other than the one you have received, you know, let me be anathema. Basically, don't follow me. So he's saying, look, even apostolic authority is worth nothing if you brand new converts who have cognitively accepted a particular gospel. And we both know what that gospel is. If you see me, big apostle, preaching something other than this gospel, forget me. So and I could keep going uh, in Second Corinthians, chapter two, verse six, plenum is used majority and actually by the majority of those who excluded. I mean, it's this once you start noticing it, it's there a good bit. But I leave that to you. There are dear brothers who disagree with me on this, and I respect them highly. Yeah. What a great question. Yes. Um, at, the, the, the brother asked, since I am a Baptist, do I forbid people from participating in the Lord's Supper who have not been baptized? Um, most, most Christians, people who call themselves Christians since Jesus, would answer that question, yes. Uh, I do forbid someone coming to the Lord's table who has not been baptized. In the New Testament, in the early church, certainly in the medieval churches, uh, certainly in all the Reformation churches, whether Lutheran or Calvinist or Anabaptist or, you know, certainly in Methodism, certainly in all the 19th century church movements, basically every place except Quakers and modern American individualistic evangelicals who don't care about anything except what they think is essential to salvation and therefore don't think about things like this. Most all the people who have ever said they were following Jesus have certainly said you must obey his command to be baptized right off the bat. Yes, because it's just the initial, it's the first step. I mean, it gets no easier than this. You know, whether it's, you think it's pouring water on your head, or I know it's laying back in water. I mean, Christian obedience, <laughs> Christian obedience just, Christian obedience doesn't get any easier. And Jesus is so clear on this. So my question to my brother is, now it's very different if we're having an intra a family debate between my dear Pado baptist brother or sister and myself. And they mean to have been baptized, and I know they haven't been. You know, and at least they think I have been, even if I'm teaching wrongly about it. That's a, there's some different issues at play then. But you ask a bolder question. You simply ask if a person has not been baptized, and I'm taking it they even know themselves they haven't been baptized, that I'm saying it's our job in obedience to Christ to lead them into that public confession of their own sin and reliance on Christ. And boy, would I love to keep talking about this, but it is 4.15. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.